Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses as we continue with part 15 of Dr. Arse Windburn Climber's Ancient Mystic Oriental Masonry. 245 The legend and traditions of Hiram Abith, for such is the rendering of the Hebrew text in the Lutheran's Bible, form the consummation of the connecting links between Freemasonry and the ancient mysteries, and sustains beyond peradventure the theory that Freemasonry dates anterior to the Deluge and the strong possibility of its divine origin. 246. We do not assert that the legend of Hiram and Beth is true. We only know that it has come to us by tradition. At what time the legend of the death of Hiram and Beth took the place of the older legends in the mysteries of Persia, India, Egypt, etc., we have no information. Nor is it important for us to know, for masonry is a succession of allegories, the mere vehicles of great lessons in morality and philosophy. 247. The Masonic legend stands by itself, unsupported by history or other than its own traditions. Yet we readily recognize in Hiram Abith, one of the masters of Freemasonry, the Osiris of the Egyptians, the Mithras of the Persians, the Bacchus of the Greeks, the Dionysius of the Fraternity of the Artisophers, and the Aetes of the Phrygians whose passion, death, and resurrection were celebrated by these people respectively. 248. For many ages and everywhere, Masons have celebrated the death of Hiram of Beth. That event therefore interests the whole world and no particular sect, order, or coterie. It belongs to no particular time, religion, or people. Everywhere among the ancient nations there exists a similar allegory and all must refer to the same great primitive fact. That fact we believe to have been the murder of Abel by his brother Cain. 249. In The Apprentice, we find reproduced the aspirant of Thebes and Eleusis, the soldiers of Mithras, the Christian catechumen, in the fellow craft, the of Eleusis, the initiate of the second order, the lion of the eastern mysteries, the Christian neophyte. In all the mysteries, there was a double doctrine. It was so everywhere, the Brahmins of India, as well as among the Druids of Germany and Gaul, at Memphis, Samothrace and Eleusis, in the mysteries of the Hebrews and early Christians, as well as those in Ceres and the Good Goddess. Everywhere we see emblems presenting a physical meaning and receiving a double interpretation, one natural and, as it were, material, within the reach of ordinary intellects, the other sublime and philosophical, which was communicated to those men of genius only who, in the preparatory degree, had understood the concealed meaning of the allegories. 250. Everywhere in the East, and Christ was in the East, the cradle of religions and allegories, we see in ancient times under different names the same idea reproduced everywhere a god, a supreme being, or an extraordinary man is slain to recommence afterwards a glorious life. Everywhere we meet the memory of a great tragical event, a crime or transgression that plunges the people into sorrow and mourning, to which soon succeeds enthusiastic rejoicing. 251. The mysteries of Osiris form the third degree or the summit of the Egyptian initiation. In these, the legend of the murder of Osiris by his brother Typhon was represented and the god was personated by the candidate. Osiris, according to the tradition, was a wise king of Egypt who, having achieved the reform of his subjects at home, resolved to spread the blessings of civilization in the other parts of the earth. This he accomplished, but on his return home he found his kingdom, which he had left in the care of his wife Isis, distracted by the seditions of his brother Typhon. Osiris attempted, by mild remonstrances, to convince his brother of the impropriety of his conduct, but he fell a sacrifice in the attempt, for Typhon murdered him in a secret apartment, and cutting up the body, enclosed the pieces in a chest, which he committed to the waters of the Nile. Isis, searching for the body, found it and entrusted it to the care of the priest, establishing at the same time the mysteries in commemoration of the foul deed. 
one piece of the body, however, she could not find, the membrum virile. For this she substituted a fictitious representation, which she consecrated and which, under the name Phallus, is to be found as the emblem of fecundity in all the ancient mysteries. 252. This legend was purely astronomical. Osiris was the sun, Isis the moon, Typhon was the symbol of winter which destroys the fecundating and fertilizing powers of the sun, thus, as it were, depriving him of life. This was the catastrophe celebrated in the mysteries and the aspirant was made to pass fictitiously through the sufferings and the death of Osiris. 253 the idea of the existence of an enlightened people who lived at a remote era and came from the east was a very prevalent notion among the ancient traditions. Ezekiel in verse 2, chapter 43 says, The glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east. Adam Clark says, All knowledge, all religion, and all arts and science have traveled accordingly to the course of the sun from the east to the west. Bazat tells us in his Manuel du Frank Macon, page 154, that the veneration which Masons entertain for the East confirms an opinion previously announced that the religious system of the Masons came from the East and has reference to the primitive religion whose first occupation was the worship of the Sun. 254. Among the Egyptians, too, the chief deity, Osiris, was but another name for the sun, while his arch enemy and destroyer, Typhon, was the typification of the night or darkness. And lastly, among the Hindu, the three manifestations of their supreme deity, Brahma, Shiva, and Vishnu, were symbols of the rising, meridian, and sitting sun. 255. This early and very general prevalence of the sentiment of sun worship is worthy of a special attention on the account of the influence that it exercised over the spurious Freemasonry of antiquity. Many indeed, nearly all of the Masonic symbols of the present day can only be thoroughly understood and properly appreciated by this reference to sun worship. 256. One thing, at least, is incapable of refusion, and that is, that we are indebted to the Tyrian Masons for the introduction of the symbol of Hiram Abith. The idea of the symbol, although modified by the Jewish Masons, is not Jewish in its inception. It was evidently borrowed from the pagan mysteries where Bacchus, Adonis, Proserpina, and a host of other apotheosized beings play the same role that Hiram does in the Masonic mysteries. 257. In every country under heaven the initiations were performed in caverns, either natural or artificial, and darkness was honored with peculiar marks of veneration by reason of its supposed priority of existence. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Light was an emblem of life and darkness of death, and death was a prelude to resurrection. It will at once be seen, therefore, in what manner the doctrine of the resurrection was inculcated and exemplified in these remarkable institutions of the ancients. 258. In all the ancient systems of initiation, the candidate was surrounded in darkness as a preparation for the reception of light. The duration varied in the different rites. In the Celtic mysteries of Druidism, the period in which the aspirant was immersed in darkness was nine days and nights. Among the Greeks at Eleusis, it was three times longer, and in the still severer rites of Mithras in Persia, fifty days of darkness, solitude and fasting were imposed upon the adventurous neophyte, who by these excessive trials was at length entitled to the full communication of the light of knowledge. 259. Darkness, like death, is the symbol of initiation. It was for this reason that all the ancient initiations were performed at night. The same custom prevails in Freemasonry, and the explanation is the same. Death and the resurrection were taught in the mysteries as they are in Freemasonry. The initiation was the lesson of death. 
the full fruition or autopsy. The reception of light was the lesson of regeneration or resurrection. 260. Light is therefore a fundamental symbol in Freemasonry. It is, in fact, the first important symbol that is presented to the neophyte in his instructions and contains within itself the very essence of speculative masonry, which is nothing more than the contemplation of intellectual light or truth. Thank you for watching. Please don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and comment. And if you can, please consider donating a little to Wars of the Rosies. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you very much.